المسلمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى من تمسك بسنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعض فإن خير الكلام كلام الله عز وجل وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Today is the first day that we're going to deal with the classic book that was authored by one of the tremendous Latin scholars of al-hadith and al-fiqh and imam al -Nawm. I have to begin by saying it is an honor to actually have this opportunity once again to teach this book in one of the masajid that are on the face of the earth. And that's because this book is one of the most important books that have been that have ever been authored. It's one of those books that the Muslim should concern himself with. So we ask Allah for al-ikhlas and we ask him for al-itqan to be precise and to bring the information that is beneficial, relative, and pertinent. I hope that you brothers and sisters will take this class as seriously as possible. Because as I told you, this is one of the books that the Muslim should engage himself in. He should encourage his wife to learn the book. If a person comprehended these 40 or 42 hadith that we're going to deal with today or in this class, inshallah, he or she will have a good concept of this religion. He doesn't have to be a hafiz of the Qur'an. If he memorized the Qur'an, that's even better. But if he got good understanding of these 50 hadith that we're going to deal with in this class, he understood them very well, he would be like an individual who is sitting on top of the mountain and he's looking at the dunya and he knows how to navigate. He knows how to welcome Ramadan. He knows how to make judgments when he hears things. He'll know how to just be a Muslim who's worth his weight in salt. As opposed to the Muslim who has a khlas because he came into Islam or he was raised in Islam. But he's like the waraqatu shajar. He's like the leaf from the tree. When it falls from the tree, it doesn't know where it's going. It's just at the mercy of the wind, if you can say that. Although Allah Azawajal is the one who makes that leaf fall exactly where he wants it to fall. The point is, the leaf is just moving like that. Some people in Al-Islam, they like that. They don't know what they're doing or why they're doing it. So I'm encouraging you brothers, to the best of your ability, to the best of your ability, try to take the class seriously. Those of you who know Arabic, you people who your lisan, your mother tongue is Arabic, we would suggest that you memorize this, these hadith. So that every time we come the following week, inshallah, you have the first hadith memorized. And many of them are very short and easy. Those of you who are not Arabs, still, you can have an opportunity to memorize a hadith. And you're going to see it's benefit in that. Benefit. So we hope that you guys, sisters, take this class seriously. And part of the seriousness in taking the classes, trying to memorize the hadith for the following week, inshallah. Seven days to memorize a hadith, and none of them are extremely long. And also, from the seriousness, those of you who want to take notes, that's also extremely important. I know there are some people who come just for the barakah of sitting in the masjid, and that's okay, inshallah, that's okay. But that's not the best way to get knowledge. But khay, khay. So we begin first by not elaborating, by saying a small, few small things about an Imam and Nawawi. An Imam and Nawawi, his name was Yahya. Yahya. Ibn Sharaf. His father's name was Sharaf. His grandfather's name was Murra. And he is an Nawawi. An Nawawi. And that's Nisbatin in a Qariya Sagira. He comes from a small town in Syria that was called Noah. The Syria right now that's being destroyed right now in the land of Hashem, the Levant. That the Prophet says, that the Malaika, 
they lowered their wings over that blessed area. So he came from that area. He was from Ahl al-Sham, Rahmatullahi alayhi. And Imam al nawawi his kumya was Abu Zakariya. Abu Zakariya. His name is Yahya. So he took the kumya of Zakariya. I mean, these scholars used to do that and people continue to do it. A person whose name is Zakariya, he'll take the kumya Abu Yahya because of the prophet in the Quran. His son, he had the prophet's name and his son was a prophet. So people take that kumya. And Imam al nawawi his laqab, his nickname, the people called him was Muhyiddin. Muhyiddin. Muhyiddin means the one who gave life to the religion. Muhyiddin. They used to say this to the scholars before. Shamsuddin, Sadruddin, Saifuddin, Qamruddin. And this name in actuality is a name that is disliked in Al-Islam. We shouldn't name our children these types of names. And we shouldn't name each other these types of names either. Those scholars who wrote books about how to name your children and things like that, they used to dislike this name. Because the Prophet his companions never named themselves these names. And also, Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Don't praise yourselves. Allah knows best who has taqwa. So, an Imam al we used to get mad. And he used to tell people, I will forgive any and everybody who trespassed against me. You stole my money, you made riba, you lied on me, we had some beef. He said, I'm going to forgive everybody. Yomu Qiyamah, everybody is forgiven. But I will not forgive the one who calls me Muhyiddin, the one who gave life to the religion. He said, when did Al-Islam die that it needed me to give life to it? So that goes to show the humility of Al-Imam al nawawi Al-Imam nawawi was a Zahid. He was a person of zuh. He was aesthetic. He didn't even get married. Rahmatullahi alayhi. He never married, never had children. So he never had children, and yet he took the kum, he took the he took the kumya, Abu Zakaria. And that's because he's from the ulama al hadith. You don't have to be married in order to take a kumya. You can even give you a small child a kumya, Abu Abdullah, Abu Abdurrahman. That's what the Prophet used to do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our mother Aisha, her kunya is Um Abdullah. And she never had any children. But the Prophet told the people, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, take a kunya. So everybody knows you by one name. And that's okay. But if you want further reward in showing your love for the sunnah, just say, if I have a baby son, I'm going to name him Abdullah. I'm Abu Abdullah. I'm Abu Saleh. I'm Um Mujahid. Or whatever. So he never got married. And he was a Zahid. He didn't like being praised, and as a result of that, he told everybody, anyone who trespassed against me, I forgive you in front of Allah. That takes a lot. How many of us, someone did something to you and you're ready to forgive? Some people I'll forgive them, some people I'm not ready to forgive. And the Imam al he said, everybody is forgiven, except the one who calls me Muhyiddin. And that's because he did not like to see himself raised up. And he was a great scholar in Islam. Today, unfortunately... If you don't call the speaker sheikh, he gets upset with you. If you don't come, if you if you don't come and give his long, elaborate, you know, resume and his CV, he gets upset with you. And Imam al we said, don't call me Muhyiddin. Don't call me Muhyiddin. Al Imam al Nawi, rahmatullahi taala, he died in the year six seven six six seven six. So in our culture, the number 666, it means something in our culture. It doesn't mean anything in the religion. But 666 means something in our culture. You guys know what it means, right? In our culture, right? So one of the ways you can remember Imam al Nawi's death is time, because you'll know you don't have to memorize all of the times when scholars died, but you want to know who was around who. Ibn Taymiyyah was around, and the Habi was around, and like this. You want to know. So if you remember one number, you can remember other people. So one of the ways you can remember an Imam al Nawi's death, 666, he's from the 6th century, is 676, 676. Anybody know who died on 911? 911? Al-Imam al-Suyuti. So you can remember Suyuti's death, 911, 911. 
And there are many scholars like that. You have to memorize these things in the way that is uh, best for you, like in an acronym or something like that. Al-Imam al nawi Rahmatullahi Alayhi, many things can be said about him, but I wanted to give you the main things. He was a Zahid. He was a humble man. He, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, never got married. And another thing. And Imam al nawi was from the Latter-day scholars that everybody in this Ummah knows about him in his books. The former ulama from the companions and then the tabi'een and those who follow the tabi'een, many people remember that. Everybody knows Bukhari and Muslim. Everyone knows Abu Hanifa, Malik. Everybody knows those people from the past. But as we get further into Islamic history, not many people know a lot of the names of the scholars. But Imam al nawi from the 6th century was one of those scholars everybody knows. And not only that, his books have been accepted in the dunya. His books have been translated into English, into Urdu, into uh, Swahili, into Somali, into Russian, in every language, his books. From his famous books, the book Riyadh al-Salihin, Everybody heard that book, everybody has that book, for the most part. The 40 hadith of Al-Imam al nawi that we're dealing with today. And imam al nawi he explained the second most important book in hadith, and that's Sahih Muslim. He explained that book, al imam al nawi And in the Shafi'i Fiqh, he has a book called al Majmur. Those four books, and he has other books, are well known in the dunya. So Allah made Qabul in the dunya for an Imam and Nawi. People accept him. Which brings me to the last issue of an Imam and Nawi, inshallah. Why is it, how is it that people accept him? Allah knows best, but maybe if we look in Surah Maryam, the end of Surah Maryam, Surah Maryam, Allah Ta'ala mentioned, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَيَجْعَلَ لَهُمُ الرَّحْمَنُ وُدَّى those people who do good deeds and they believe correctly, Allah Ar-Rahman is going to put love for that individual. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in authentic hadith that was collected by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Inna Allah idha ahabba abdin nada ya Jibril inni uhibbu fulan fa ahbibhu fa yuhibbu Jibril. ثم ينادي جبريل في أهل السماء إن الله يحب فلان فحبوه فيحبه أهل السماء ثم يودوا له القبول في الأرض authentic hadith if Allah loves someone Allah calls out to Jibril and he says to Jibril Jibril I love so and so so therefore you love him what Allah loves we love what Allah hates we hate it's our religion Anything that Allah loves, we love. What Allah hates, we hate. So beware of the people who are trying to pass off to us loving things or accepting things, not even loving, accepting things that we know that Allah hates. Many things that Allah hates. So in our environment, we have to be flexible and we have to know what we're dealing with and how to deal with it. Homosexuality, different things. We realize where we are. We can't, we can't, be prejudiced against homosexuals. We can't harm homosexuals. We can't just do anyway. We have to follow the law as it relates to that. But beware of being a person who comes and says, I accept this thing, not even loving. I accept this thing. What Allah loves, we love. What Allah hates, we hate. But in loving that thing, we act a certain way, depending upon the situation. In hating that thing, we act a certain way, depending upon that situation. Just don't come and force that on him. So if Allah loves someone, he tells Jibril, I love so-and-so. Jibril doesn't say, well, I don't want to love him a lot. As you want a lot. Jibril can't say that. He has to do what Allah told him to do. And then Jibril goes and tells the angels in the heavens, hey, angels, Allah loves so-and-so, so you love him. And then the angels begin to love him. And then his acceptance is put on the <coughs> earth. So we take this as a sign, and Allah knows best, that Allah loved Al-Imam al nawi and Allah knows best. I can't emphatically state that, but the fact that the whole Ummah has accepted his works, 
and his personality. Everybody loves Al Imam Al Nawi. You don't have any opponents against Al Imam Al Nawi. Everybody loves him. Every culture knows about him. Everybody has books that he has authored. Everybody. It may be Allah Al Rahman. He loves Al Imam Al Nawi. Allah Alam. After that, Ikhwani, we come to explaining the book itself. We come to the book itself. Before getting into the book, there's a bit of introduction we need to know about some things concerning Al Imam and Nawawi's book to get a better appreciation. For an example, Sahih Bukhari. If you're going to learn about Sahih Bukhari, if you're going to read Sahih Bukhari, if you want to know where that book is, if someone were to tell you, and Imam al-Bukhari's book, it has thousands of hadith in it. Every time he wanted to put a hadith in his book, he would make a ghusl and then pray to rakats. If someone heard that, he'll have an appreciation for the book that maybe he wouldn't have had had he not known that. That man would make a ghusl and two rakat before every single hadith. He would appreciate it more. So we want to give you this simple, easy background Simple, easy background about the book itself. There are a number of a hadith that say, whoever saves and protects 40 hadith, my 40 hadith for my sunnah, he will be raised up near Muqiyama with the ulama. He will be raised up near Muqiyama with the fuqaha. Allah will put him into the jannah. He won't go and he won't uh, get the punishment of the hellfire. They are many in their Transmissions, many chains of narration, all of them are weak. Whoever memorizes 40 hadith, whoever saves 40 hadith for my ummah, whoever teaches 40 hadith, then he'll get this and get that. All of those hadith are weak. All of them, all of them. But we found the scholars of Islam writing books calling it 40 hadith. The first one who ever did it was one of the greatest scholars from the Mutaqaddimin, Al Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Ten people are Amir al Mu'minin and Hadith, highest level. Abdullah ibn Mubarak was one of them. He was the first one to write 40 Hadith, a book about 40 Hadith. Also, Al Imam al Bayhaqi, he wrote a book about 40 Hadith, not just Al Imam al Nawi. And after the many, many scholars, until we came to the latter day scholars, like Al Imam Al Nawawi, he wrote a book for the Hadith. Like Al Imam Ibn Hajr Al Haythami, not Ibn Hajr Al Asqalani, who explains Sahih Bukhari, Ibn Hajr Al Haythami, he wrote a book about 40 Hadith. So there are hundreds of books of 40 Hadith that the scholars wrote. Not just this one of Al Imam Al Nawawi, this is the most famous one. But there are hundreds of them, hundreds of them. You have scholars who wrote books, 40 hadith in usul and furu, 40 hadith in the virtues of la ilaha illallah, 40 hadith in the importance of al-jihad, 40 hadith in the importance of al-nikah, 40 hadith in al-adab, al-adab, 40 hadith in al-khutu, the importance of the khutbah, Many, many issues, many, many, many issues. 40 hadith and at tasawwuf and the meaning of 40 hadith and at tasawwuf it means a zuhd, being an aesthetic. Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib, aw abir as sabir, being the dunya as if you were a stranger or a person crossing the street. It's not Sufism as we know it, a zuhd. 40 hadith that encourage you to not be a son of the dunya, an abd of the dunya. So there are many hadith, many books, 40 hadith, many. It's not just this one. Now the reason why those scholars did that is, number one, ikhwani, they don't want to rely on weak hadith. Whoever saves 40 hadith, teaches 40 hadith, will raise up, be raised up, go to Jannah. We have what's authentic that we can use. Like the instruction of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لِيُبَلِّغَ الشَّاهِدُ مِنْكُمْ الْغَائِبِ he used to tell his companions after he tell them a hadith, he said, let those who are present who hear me, let them tell the ones who are absent. So that's an encouragement. Listen to what he's saying. Pay attention to his hadith. 
He said it may be that the one who was told about it understands it better than the one who heard it. So when one of the companions hears his hadith, like Umar, <coughs> Umar, he had a neighbor, he would work in the field one day, and Umar would come and listen to the hadith. And then the next day, Umar would work and he would come. Whatever he heard on that day, he would go to his companion and tell him. So Umar is a knowledgeable person, more knowledgeable than his neighbor. So when Umar's neighbor comes, and Umar neighbor, Umar's neighbor hears the hadith, and he goes and tells Umar, Umar's going to understand it better than him. Because Umar's knowledge was more than his. So that hadith is an encouragement. Memorize a hadith. Let the one who hears me tell the one who is not here. And why did he say that? He said that hadith on the day of the Hajj. He gathered all of the people and he started telling them different things about the last sermon. And then at the end of the last sermon he said, Let those who are present tell those who are absent. We were not there. But right now we know all of those a hadith. Because the companions related to the people, related to the people until it came to us. So that's an encouragement of putting this book together. Teaching hadith, learning hadith. Another encouragement is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nadrullahu nadrullahu mri'an sami'a hadithi fahafidaha kama sami'aha. May Allah give light to the face of a person who memorized my hadith the way he heard it. So he made dua for that individual who says the hadith the way it should have been said. So in the Christian religion, Judaism, they say anything that they want to say. God said this, Jesus said that, and as a result of that, they lost their religion. In Al-Islam, we can't do that. We can't say weak hadith, we can't make up hadith, we have to just stick to it. So those scholars of Islam, they wrote those books, 40 hadith, and many, many different issues, but we don't use the weak hadith to predicate these actions on them because all of the scholars know that that hadith is not authentic. So if anyone asks you, you yourself, don't ever believe anybody who writes a book, 40 hadith, who go to Jannah, anybody memorize 40 hadith, all of those are not authentic. All of them, not authentic. As it relates to the book of Al-Imam al nawawi Rahmatullahi Alayhi, <coughs> he has 42 hadith in this book, not 40. It's 42 that Al Imam al we put, not 40. They call it 40 hadith taqliban, taqliban. It's like in our language, in our culture. I want to ask you a question. They say a picture is worth how many words? How many? A thousand. Why don't they say a picture is worth a hundred words? Why don't they say a picture is worth 50? A picture is worth 50 words? Where did that number a thousand came, come from? It came from somewhere in America. I know from America that they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Here in the UK, you say the same thing. It's just in our culture. But a picture can be worth 10,000 words. So they call that a taglid. It just happens like that. Happens like that. I don't know in your culture here. Let me ask you. When someone has an important question, they say they add a, a price to it. A price. Like the $100,000 question is... What price do you people add? What do you say here? In America, they say the $64 question is. I don't know where that number came from. $64. Why can't it be the $100,000 question? But these are just things that nuances that come in the culture. So he put 42 hadith. But it's called the 40 hadith taliban. So it's 42. And it was increased by eight hadith by one of the great scholars who explained the book. His name is Ibn Rajab, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, who was from the students of Ibn Utaymiyyah. So we understand from that that Nawawi was before Ibn Utaymiyyah. So Ibn Rajab al Hanbali, he came and he added eight to the 42 that Al Imam and Nawawi had. And Imam Ibn Rajab, he explained this book. Ibn Rajab explained and know his book. I encourage you brothers to get that book because it's been translated into English. It's called Jamil Ulum Al-Hikam. Jamil 
العلوم والحكم في شرح خمسين حديثا من جوامع الكلم. That book is in English. You can get it for free. You can get it online. The one who translated his name is a Sheikh Jamaluddin Zarbuza. Just put Zarbuza. He's a revert from Spain. A white guy. European guy. Grew up in America. Taught himself Arabic. Back in the 80s and the 90s. He was one of the famous prolific du'at. Spanish man. A Spaniard. So he translated that tremendous book. By Ibn Rajab. Also one of the scholars, another student of Ibn Taymiyyah, his name is Ibn Daqiq al -i. He also explained the book, like many scholars, but the one of Ibn Rajab is the one you have to get. So how many hadith that Imam al we bring? 42. And Ibn Rajab, he added 8, so it's 50. But why is it 40? Call 40 hadith if it's 42. Because that's just the number that they use. Like we use a thousand and so forth and so on <coughs> for different things. As for the subject matter of this book, now this is important because I just told you. Many scholars, they wrote books for the hadith. For the hadith and al diyat. 40 hadith about exercising, the importance of exercising, the importance of exercising. Al-Mu'min al-Qawi, khayru wa ahabbur Allah min al-Mu'min al-Dhaif, the strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weak one. So they'll bring all of those hadith about the importance of archery, the importance of being a warrior. Al-Riyadiyah, al-Riyadiyah, the 40 hadith of marriage. من تزوج فقد استكمل النصف دينه فليتق الله في شكل آخر. Anyone who gets married, he completed half of his religion. Let him fear Allah, not another half. That book is only going to bring hadith connected to marriage. Forty hadith of jihad. That's only going to talk about jihad. What is Al Imam Al Nawawi's book about? What is this about? Is it about marriage? Is it about jihad? Is it about tasawwuf? Is it about nikah? Is it about al-adab? No. And Imam and Nawi's book is about the Jawami al Kalam. And this is a phrase you have to know. I've said it in this masjid a few times. Anybody know from amongst you what is the Jawami al Kalam? What does that mean, Jawami al Kalam? Anybody know? <coughs> this book that Al Imam and Nawi brought <coughs> is the book in which he only brought the Ahadith that are from the Prophet's Jawami al kalim Jawami al kalim Wish we had a blackboard right here. But you spell it how you want to. Jawami al kalim It's in our religion. And in knowing your Prophet and your Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you should try to know this. He said in the number of authentic hadith, Fuddiltu ala al-anbiya'i bisittin. I have been given preference and precedence and superiority over all of the other prophets and messengers by six things. I've been given six things, none of them were given. And one of the things he said he was given, Jawami al kalam wa khawatimiha. He was given the Jawami al kalam Jawami al kalam is his ability to say something that has a few words, but it has far reaching implications. And it's not just eloquence. You can say something in an eloquent way, like the politicians. They speak eloquently, but they're not saying anything. You ask them a question, he uses all of these big words, and you go all the way around, and then after asking a question, you're still looking at him dumbfounded. But he used big words, you need a dictionary to understand, but he didn't say anything. It's not eloquence like that. It is the ability to say something, but that one thing that he said, it had far-reaching implications and many, many benefits. Like the hadith that's in this book. When the man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, give me advice. Rasulullah said to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La Tabda. Don't get angry. Okay, I won't. What's the next one? Again, don't become angry. Okay, I got it. What's the next one? Give me new advice. He said it three times. Don't become angry. Now as we live right here, all, all of us, without any exceptions, 
all of us have tasted the marara, the, uh, the sourness, the sting of anger. Either because we got angry or other people got angry. And there's a sting connected to it. It's the third divorce, you're done. You said something to your wife, she'll never forgive it for it. She says something to you, you'll never forgive her for it. The mother says, out of anger, may the curse of Allah be upon you. And as a result of that, that dua is answered. Anger is a mushkir. So when he said, la tagda, the iman can come here for the rest of this year. From now to Ramadan, he gave the khutbah about anger. He would have done a service to the community. Many things to talk about concerning anger. That's what this book is about. And Imam Anoui was in concern with many of the ahadith that the Prophet said وسلم, about ahkam, rules and regulations. Although it has some rules and regulations, he was concerned with the ahadith from the jawami and kalim. Those things, if you were to look at them and dissect them, you would see that his words were impregnated with a lot of fawaid and ibr, benefits, lessons, many, 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 many. That's what this book is about. That's what this book is about. It's not about marriage as such. It's not about jihad as such. It's not about adab as such. Although all of those issues are mentioned here. It is about the jawami and kalim of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Now we come to the hadith. The very first hadith. And Imam al Nawawi, he doesn't do what the scholars of al-Hadith normally do when they bring the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He doesn't bring the whole chain of narration. He just stops at the companion who narrated the hadith. And he said here, Rahmatullahi alayhi an amir al-mu'mineen Abi Hafs radiallahu anhu and Abu Hafs is Umar ibn al-Khattab he called Umar by his kunya, Abu Hafs. We have to stop here. Abu Hafs. Umar, he had a nickname, just like Ali Imam He has a nickname, he has a kunya. And know his nickname is Abu Zakaria. His kunya is Muhyuddin. Umar, his name is Umar. His nickname is Al Farooq, because the Prophet called him that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his kunya is Abu Hafs. This is important. Scholars of Islam, they wrote books about how to name yourself and how to name your children. How to name yourself and how to name your children. Brother had a relationship in Jahiliya. The lady had a son. The son is 20 something years old. The son had a son from marriage. To a non Muslim girl, but the son is a Muslim not practicing. The father speaks to the son and said, I heard you had a child. He said, Yes. He said, What did you name the child? He said, I named the child Jaquan. <laughs> okay, no problem. You can make up a name, no problem. Especially in the African American community, we come up with crazy names Jaquan, Fuquan. We have a lot of crazy names. This will sound good. There's a singer's name is Jaheem. Jaheem is the knot of Jahannam. That name is Jaheem. What's the name of your son? Jaquan. Okay, okay. Jaquan what? He was hoping that the boy would say, Jaquan, the name of his son, Abdullah, the name of the father who's calling, Ahmed. He said, I call him Jaquan Amir Johnson. The whole naming system is wrong. The whole system is wrong. She comes and she marries her husband. She's born and raised as a Muslim. Her name is Fatima Muhammad Ali Chowdhury. When she marries her husband, she becomes Fatima and she takes his last name, Fatima Dahabi. It's not, you can't do that. There's fiqh in the way you name yourself. Things you should say, things you shouldn't say. So one of the things the scholars wrote about in this issue is the kunya and the nicknames. So here we have Umar. His kunya is Abu Hafs. This is important, guys. Hafs is really Hafsa. His daughter Hafsa, who married the Prophet ﷺ. But she was called Hafs because in the Arabic language, it is permissible to cut off the ta and marbuta 
if there's no ishkal. You can cut off the tab marbuta in the Arabic language, writing it or saying it, if the person is going to understand what you're talking about. So Rasulullah used to call our mother Aisha, used to call her Aish. And he would say Aisha. Because in the Arabic language, you can cut the tab marbuta off if there be no problems. But if there's a man, his name is Aish, and a woman, her name is Aisha, don't say ya Aish and you're talking to Aisha. Because there's Ishkal. He's going to think you're talking about him. Mecca. So the scholar wrote something and he said he went and he made Umrah in Mecca. And he didn't put the tab marbuta. You know he's talking about Mecca. That's number one. That's why it's Abu Hafs. But it's talking about Hafsa. Number two, it goes to show the permissibility of taking a kunya after your daughter. A man came to the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet heard that they were calling him. They were calling him Abu Hakam. Abu Hakam. He said, Why do they call you that? He said, Because whenever the people have a dispute, they come to me and I, may, I render a judgment, and both sides are always happy with my judgment, so they call me the father of ruling. The Prophet said, No, Allah is Al Hakam. Don't take that name. And that goes to show the seriousness of judging by other than what Allah revealed. It's not a small thing. So when we say to brothers who that is their da'wah, that is their path, we're with you. It's a serious thing. If someone comes and says, hey people, be careful about voting. Voting is kufr and shik. Don't look at him and say, ah, you're mutashiddi, you're too rough, you're too tough. Because judging by other than what Allah revealed is kuf, and if we knew a tawheed and the importance of aqidah, we would know it's a serious issue. Am lahum shuraka'u shara'u lahum min al-deen. Ma lam ya'dhim bi'illah. Do they have partners who have legislated for them what Allah didn't let? And Allah called them partners. It's shirk. Wa man lam ya'hkum bima anzal Allah fi ula'ika hum al-kafirun. But, Relax, because there are those ulama who also took pros from the kitab and the sunnah and the maqasid of the religion, the goals and the objectives, and those scholars said it's permissible to vote under certain circumstances. If we are going to vote for someone who can clearly minimize the harm that comes to us. He doesn't get rid of all of it, but he minimizes it like sex education, like different things that when they run, they're going to help the community with that. They're going to increase us with some good. If that can really happen, then it's permissible to vote. So both sides should be balanced. It should be tolerant. But the point here is the other side. If someone comes and says we shouldn't vote because of his seriousness, don't say he should be, he's rough and tough. Respect that point of view because it's serious. And the one who says, that you can't vote. When he looks at the one who says you can't vote, don't look at him, you don't have any deen. You, you want shit. You, don't be like that. Because there are goals and objectives of our religion and fatwas that support both sides. So you take your side with knowledge and don't be argumentative and intolerant. Abu Hafs, it shows that man came. He said, they call me Abu Hakam. Rasulullah said, okay, what, you have sons? He said, yes. He said, what's their names? He said, I have Abdullah, I have Muslim, and I have Shureh. I have three sons. Abdullah, Muslim, and Shureh. Rasulullah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which one is the eldest? He said, Shureh. He said, you're Abu Shureh. Which one is the eldest? Shureh. You're Abu Shureh. Abdullah is a better name than Shureh. Muslim is a better name than Shureh. But because Shurei was the eldest, we understand from that, from the fifth of taking a kunya, is you name it after your eldest son. The kunya is after your eldest son, Abu Usama. But Umar was Abu Hafsa. So it goes to show the permissibility of taking a kunya after the girl. Because Hafsa was older than Umar's son Abdullah. And there were other companions who had kunyas after their daughters, like Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman had a daughter, Layla. It was Abu Layla. A companion, Abu Umama. The tremendous companion, Abu Darda. 
who named both of his wives Ummu Darda and Ummu Darda. Darda is the girl who has dimples in her cheek. Abu Rayhana, Abu Aisha, Abu Jamila, from the Salaf, Abu Hanifa. So if your daughter is the eldest, you can take that kunya. It's permissible. It's permissible. It's permissible. So that's what we say about Abu Hafs Umar. Hafs here is Hafsa. He said, he heard the Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna man a'malu bin niyat, wa inna ma li kulli mri'in ma noah. Fa man kanat hijratu wa Allahi wa rasulihi, fa hijratu wa Allahi wa rasulihi. Wa man kanat hijratu wa dunya li yusibaha, aw imra'atin yankahuha, fa hijratu wa ma hajra ilayhi. The Nabi said in this Jawamir Kenan, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Verily, your deeds, the deeds will be judged based upon the intention. And verily, every single individual will get that which he intended. So the person who made hijrah with the intention of going for Allah and his messenger, to Allah and his messenger, because of Allah and his messenger he made the hijrah, then that's what his reward will be. That's what his hijrah was all about. It was for Allah and his messenger. It was for ikhlas, sincerity. That's what he wanted. And anyone who made hijra to get some dunya, some benefit, a job, money, wealth, status, a nice house, or he made hijra to get married to a woman, there's a lady over there that he's digging her. Anybody who made hijra because of that, then his hijra will be accordance, in accordance to what he made it for. And then that Imam and Noah told us this hadith has been collected by the two Imams of the Muhaddithin. He didn't say that he, it was collected by some of the Muhaddithin. He said by the two Imams and leaders of the Muhaddithin. First one is Abu Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn Mughira ibn Bazdaz, Bardezba al-Bukhari. And also by Imam Abu Hussein, Muslim ibn al-Hujjaj ibn Muslim al-Qushayri and Naysaburi in their two books, Sahihain. And they are the two most authentic books that have ever been authored. They are the two most authentic books that have ever been authored. That's the first hadith of Hwani. Now, this first hadith is tremendously important. I don't think anybody here has existed in Al Islam and didn't hear this hadith. This hadith is one of the most important hadith in Al Islam. Some of the ulama said that this hadith is half of this religion. Some of the ulama say this is one of the hadith that the whole religion of Al Islam revolves around. This hadith is critical in getting fit. Abu Usama coming right now to give this class, what is his hijrah for? What is his niyyah? So the people can look at me and say, oh, look, look at that, look at that. And why are you sitting there? And this one is writing and the other one is not writing. That one is in the front row. That This hadith is connected to everything we do every single day. And it's one of those hadith that the Muslims should not be jahil about. about. So we're going to take our time on it because it has a lot of benefits. And I have to, I have to deal with this issue of the chain of narration. So I'm going to ask these three brothers, starting with that brother right there. And then that one and that one, I need you to come up here. Hurry up, guys. Hurry up. You three. Stop moving like you got molasses. Come on. Come on. You three. One, two, three. Come. Come on. Come on. What's wrong with our kids, man? It's like you point to them and they, they keep looking around. They keep looking around. I didn't mean you, but you're making it easy. You two. Come on. Two more. Hurry up. Whose sons are these? Come. Come. Come up here. Come up here. Whose sons are these guys? And now they're four. <laughs> All right, you get over here. You get over here. You can stay there. You can stay there. You can stay there. What's your name, son? Asif. Asif? I know Asif, yeah. What's your name? Jamal. Jamal. What's your name? Jazz. Ijaz? Jazz. Jazz. Okay, guys. Chain of narration is important. Umar, and we're just going to use this symbol. We don't believe in imitating Umar or imitating the prophets and the messengers. But we're using this as a symbol so you'll get a visual. 
Ramadan heard this hadith from the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he's the only companion who narrated this hadith. And there are hundreds of thousands of companions. So how is it and why is it that only Umar narrated? You ain't going to find this hadith authentic on another companion, not Abu Hurairah, anyone, only Umar. That's it. He's the only companion who narrated this hadith. This man, his name is Al-Qama, Al-Qama ibn Waqqas. He narrated it from Umar, and he's the only one from the Tabi'een. Umar is in the level of the companions, 100,000. The Tabi'een learned from the companions, 200,000, 300, even more. But this man, Al-Qama, Al-Qama ibn Waqqas is the only one who narrated from Umar. And he's the Amir al-Mu'mineen. All the people met him. He was leading the people, teaching the people. On Juma, Khutbah Eid, he's telling the people. And this is an important hadith, but only Umar got it. And only he took it from Umar. Al-Qama, only Al-Qama. And then after Al-Qama, who took it from Al-Qama is a man, his name is Muhammad Ibrahim. Muhammad Ibrahim, a taymi. So, Al-Qama, Al-Qama, Al-Layfi, only one. The only one who took it from him, Muhammad Ibrahim. How was that? And then there came a man, and his name was Yahya ibn Sa'id. He took it from Muhammad, and over 700 people took it from him. Many people. We understand that. Many people. From them, the great ulama of Islam. Like the ones who had the madah, Like Abdullah ibn Mubarak, for an example. Like Al-Imam al-Awza'i had a madah. He took it from him. From who? Yahya ibn Sa'id al Ansari. Also, from those who took the hadith from him, the 700 people, many. Al Imam Malik, Al Imam Sufyan al Thawri, Al Imam ibn Uyayna, Al Imam Shu'aba, all of them took it from him. But only Umar? That's kind of strange. And only this one man from the Tabi'een, Al Qama, Al Layfi, that's it? And only one man from him? And then he took it from him, and then many people took it from him. Now, this is from the Gharaib of Al Imam al Bukhari Sahih. When you look at Al Imam Sahih al Bukhari, his book, here, yeah, some regular people just read the hadith and that's it. That book is an amazing piece of work. It is an amazing piece of work. When you talk about the computer and what the computer can do, Sahih al Bukhari is like that. But because we're living close to the time, Yom al Qiyamah, because Iman is low and things like that, it's easy for the Muslims to say, hey, uh, uh, not just Bukhari, they'll say, hey, I don't want that hadith, I don't want the Sunni, it doesn't go with my mind. And some people reject this hadith. Why? The intellect. How is it possible that only Umar? How is that possible? And doesn't that make sense? That does make sense, though, right? How can such an important hadith only one companion hear it? And how is it possible all the people who love Umar and want to learn from him, only one person took it, and then one from him, and then he took it from him and the rest of people took it from him. How, how is that possible? He's the only one who took it from him, the only one, but many people took it from him. How is that? Okay, guys, you can sit down. Thank you very much. Hurry up, man. Get the molasses out of your feet, man. These <laughs> guys move like molasses in the wintertime. You know when molasses, it go real slow like that. Syrup. And in the wintertime, it's even slow. But you put them out on the football pitch, and they be all over the place. May Allah bless you, Shabbat. Khwani, you call this hadith, the hadith and ahad hadith with a singular narration. It's important, guys. I don't want to get too deep, but it's our religion. They call this the hadith ahad, from the word ahad, wahid. It's an irregular hadith, only one narrator. Some of the people who use their brains and their intellect and their philosophical, they come and they say, we reject any and every hadith like this. Even if it's with Bukhari and Muslim, like this particular hadith of Bukhari Muslim. And their reasoning is, how can we accept it? How? We can't fathom only Umar narrating. We can't fathom only one tablet. We can't fathom. So I'm going to throw it away. That's not scholastic. You don't accept and reject things based upon that. How do you know it's true? 
Because Abu Usama said it on the minbar on Friday. That makes it true. That doesn't make it true. Things that are true or not true, correct and correct, in our religion, there are characteristics that are connected, sciences that are connected to it. So we say very quickly, without getting deep into this, we say very quickly, Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُ Whatever the Prophet gives to you, take it. And whatever he prohibits you from leaving. So if he brings you a hadith that's ahad, or a hadith that's aziz, with two narrators, or when that is mutawatir, many, many narrators, it's irrelevant. As long as the men in that chain of narration are good, then that hadith is authentic. Because if you open up the door like this, you will reject a lot of this religion. And plus, the Salaf didn't know this stuff. The people of the past, they were not like this. They didn't use their brain like this. Look how many proofs there are against this. Only one person came, so I can't take it because only one person. The issue of the Qibla, the issue of the Qibla. The Muslims used to face Beit al-Maqdis when they prayed. And the Prophet wasallam wanted to be different from the Yahud and the Nasara. So he used to look up in the sky, wanting that Allah would reveal something to change the Qibla from Beit al-Maqdis to Mecca. And that ayat was revealed. Surah Al-Baqarah, ayat 144. فِي السَّمَاءِ فَلَنُوَلِّيَنَّكَ قِبْلَةً تَرْضَاهَا فَوَلِّي وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ We see you, Muhammad, looking up to the sky, desiring a change of the Qibla. We see you doing that. And now we're going to change your Qibla to one that you're pleased with. When you want to pray, turn your face to the Qibla, Masjid al-Haram. When that ayat was revealed in the Prophet's Masjid, Everybody heard it. Rasulullah read those ayats to him. But Rasulullah was in his masjid. One of his companions went to another masjid, Masjid Quba. Masjid Quba. After the incident, he went to Masjid Quba. The people were praying. That companion said, Hey, the Qibla has been changed. And then he read the ayat. When the Muslims heard that ayat in prayer, they turned around in prayer. Why? Because the one who is telling them is from the companions. And he's fitha. He saw that none of the companions are kiddah. None of them. Those brothers I showed you, there are many people on that man's level. Many, many in their era. Some of them are truthful, some of them are not. Some of them forgot, some of them didn't. But those companions, Allah said, Radhi Allahu Anhu. Allah is pleased with all of them. Yeah, some of them made zina, some of them murdered someone, someone did this, someone did that, but they were not liars. And there's just too many ahadith to tell you about this particular issue, we don't have time. So, no one said, no, you have to bring someone else to support that statement. You by yourself is not enough. They didn't, they, they didn't say that. Based on his one statement, everybody moved. The famous hadith, I mean, so many incidents. The famous hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, Rasulullah sent Mu'adh ibn al-Jabal to Yemen by himself. He told Mu'adh, you're going to the people of Ahl al-Kitab. Make the first thing you give them da'wah to la ilaha illallah. If they accept that, tell them they have to pray five times a day. If they accept that, tell them they have to give zakat. And when you take their zakat, stay away from the best of their wealth. Mu'adh went by himself. He started telling the people, La ilaha illallah. Not a single person said, No, 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 we can't accept this from you because you're by yourself. You have to bring someone else, another companion. No, he gave da'wah to La ilaha and the people accepted. And giving da'wah to La ilaha illallah is aqidah. He's giving da'wah to aqidah. Telling them about salah, it's about the ahkam. So this particular hujjah, this argument of these people, is just philosophical rhetoric. Beware of these people. And you know one of the groups today that believes in this? And many of their followers don't even know that? Hezb al-Tahrir. Many of our sincere brothers who want the ruling by what Allah revealed, 
they are fixated on this particular issue, but they don't know the history many times, who started that group and what was the IP of that group. The man who started that group, he was of the opinion, you don't have to accept the hadith and ahad, it's rejected and aqid and ahkam. I'm not saying that to point out brothers from Hezbo Tahrir. I'm not saying that for that reason. Because this hadith is applicable to me. Whoever came for hijra to put someone down from the community to big himself up a thing, that's what you're going to get the reward for. What I'm saying is, it's intertwined and interconnected. As you sit there and you see this visual, you sit there and you say, hey, that's Umar, he's thicker, he's thicker, we're going to accept it. Okay, and that's the right way. But if you belong to a group of people who are teaching you these types of ways, we should know. This particular thing this person is saying is wrong. Whatever comes to us from the Prophet Wasallam, we have to accept it, provided that the people who are saying it are good people, acceptable people, and people who narrations from them are accepted. Last thing we want to say, Ikhwani, and a lot can be said. Last thing that we want to say, inshallah, is concerning this hadith being the first hadith of 40 hadith. <coughs> when the scholars put their books together, the ulama of Islam, it's not done in a ha 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 haphazard way. It's like when you go to the university, the people who put the um, syllabus together, it's not haphazard. It goes from easy to hard, usually, and the introduction is always a minhaj, a methodology. And Imam al-Bukhari and Imam al nawawi he put this book first, this hadith first for a reason. One reason is because of the importance of the hadith that I told you about. Number two is because many of the scholars of the past used to start their books off with this hadith, irregardless of what the subject matter is of the book. Al-Bukhari and his son al-Bukhari, the very first hadith, is this إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ and Imam al-Bukhari. One of the greatest scholars of Islam, his name is Abdul Ghani al-Maqtasi. He has a book called Umdatu al-Ahkam. Umdatu al-Ahkam. One of the most important books to study when you want to study fiqh from hadith. What is that book, Umdatu al-Ahkam? It's a book in which he only put in that book the hadith where Bukhari and Muslim have agreed on it. Like this book, Hadith. And he's going to give you fiqh rulings. You know how you get a book in fiqh? Any book in fiqh. Any book. They're going to talk about the water. They're going to talk about ghusl. They're going to talk about wudu, ghusl. They're going to talk about salat, zakat. They're going to talk about adhan, marriage, jihad. He brought a book, Umdatul Ahkam, where he only brought the hadith where Bukhari and Muslim agreed on this hadith to explain the importance of wudu. Bukhari and Muslim brought this hadith about nikah. And it's difficult to make a book like that. Difficult. You know how much knowledge you have to have to be able to pick out only the hadith. Bukhari and Muslim, for every point you're trying to prove, so that if the Muslim, if the Muslim were to learn this book, memorize for the most part, he knows what he's saying is authentic. Because it's in Bukhari and Muslim. Anyway, he started that book of fiqh with this hadith. إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ One of the great scholars of Islam, Al-Imam Al-Baghri. Al-Imam Abu Bakr Hussein ibn Muhammad Al-Baghri. He has two very important books. He has a book called Shah al-Sunnah. It's comparative fit. One of the most important books written in Islam. He started it off with this hadith. It's a fit book. Started off with this hadith. He has another hadith similar to Riyadh al-Salihin. It's called Masabih al-Sunnah. He started off with this hadith. So you get the point. And there are many books like that. And Imam al nawawi did his books like that. Riyadh al-Salihin starts off with this hadith. He wrote a book, the, the <coughs> Kitab Mashru' al-Mujmu' started off with this hadith. Started off with this hadith, with this hadith. So an Imam I know we started his book off with this hadith as if to say, as if to say, get your niyyah together. I and Noe, I'm putting this book together 
And the first thing is my niyyah. You as the Muslim have a good niyyah. You as the teacher, you as the student, you as the one giving sadaqah, have a good niyyah. You people who brought the food for the people, have a good niyyah. Make your niyyah. You wearing the jilbab, the niqab, have a good niyyah. You, you got your beard, have a good niyyah. You're going to pray your niyyah. You're going to be the mu'adhan, have a good niyyah. Any and everything that you should, you do, you got to realize, you're a niyyah. That's why the scholar said this hadith is half of the religion. Because the religion is your niyyah and it's your actions. And all of the actions will be accepted or rejected by Allah based upon, number one, what is the niyyah? Number two, is it in accordance to the sunnah? Some of the scholars like Imam Ahmed, and Imam Ahmed said, the asul of the religion, the three main hadith in this religion are three. First one, inna mal'amalu bin niyat. This one that we're dealing with. Number two, the hadith of Aisha. Whoever introduced in this religion was not from it will be rejected. Your actions. Number three, the third one, the hadith of al bin Bashir. Verily the halal is clear, the haram is clear. And between the two of them is the gray area that not many people know about. He said, those are the three main hadith of this whole religion. So we're going to stop right here, inshallah, as we gentlemen. I wanted to share with you, brothers, some of the things that the ulama of Islam said about these two hadith, this one hadith. But we're going to stop right here, inshallah. If you brothers have any questions, we'll give you the benefits in some of the ahkam of the hadith next week, inshallah, as we gentlemen. Or... In two weeks' time, a fourth night. Do you brothers have any questions concerning what was said? I didn't come.